Hi, my name is Jim and today's topic is AC parallel circuits and uh, before we get into this in any detail let's just take a look at some generalities here. In a series circuit where you can have the C or an L, um, what we have in common is the current flows through both of them. And in a parallel circuit where we could have the C or an L, and I'm only using two components here to begin with, is that the voltage across the elements are what is in common. Now, in generalities, these circuits have very different properties. In some ways, they're opposites. So one of those opposites is if the absolute value of x, all that means is the magnitude of x without any angles, becomes greater than r. So if x is greater than r, the angle moves toward plus or minus 90 degrees, meaning more inductive or more capacitive, depending upon whatever part we have in there. So in a series circuit, we might say the biggest guy dominates. Now in a parallel circuit, it's exactly the opposite. If the absolute value of x becomes less than r, the angle moves toward 90 degrees, plus or minus 90 degrees again, depending on whether we're dealing with a C or an L. Now the reason that is, is that the lower the impedance of the capacitor relative to the resistor, the more current is going to flow through the capacitor. Therefore, the capacitor is going to dominate as far as phase angle is concerned. So in a parallel resonance circuit, it's about current flow. In a series, uh, in a parallel circuit, it's about current flow. In a series of circuits, it's about the voltage drop across each one. So, having said that, um, there are three methods of solving um, parallel circuits that we're going to speak to. And the first one is the product over sum, and this is uh, what um, you learn in DC circuits, that if you have two resistors in parallel, RA and RB, if we take the product over the sum of those, we can end up with the total resistance. And uh, again, we're only going to be working with two parts. Now, the same is true in AC circuits, only here I've got an impedance, and this is going to be either a capacitor or an inductor, for this example, and here I've got a resistor in parallel with it, and I put some dots around this here, I'm calling this resistor ZR, so I'm going to be representing that in polar form as a magnitude at zero degrees. And we can also say that the total impedance is equal to the product of the um, ZC, the capacitor uh, impedance in this case, I'm using capacitor, and ZR divided by the sum of the two. So that doesn't seem to be too bad. Um, here's the circuit I'm going to use, and I'm not using phasor notation with the bars again, is we have a capacitor with a reactance of negative J600 ohms in parallel with a resistor of 800 ohms and when you're dealing with imaginary parts, I should say imaginary, with capacitors and inductors it's very very easy to flip back and forth between rectangular and polar. So I have built a little chart here to do that in rectangular format the negative J 600 ohms is simply represented at 600 at negative 90 degrees ohms and likewise for the resistor rather trivial 800 is represented at 800 at 0 degrees ohms. So I just use this to keep things straight. So um, running our formula here, Z total is the product. So we have 800 ohms at 0 degrees, it's the real part, times 600 ohms at negative 90 degrees. Uh, let me fix this here. This should be an R. And that should be a C. Okay. And what we have to note is that the unit on this is ohms squared. So we're multiplying two parts together that have the properties of ohms. So we have ohms squared. And then in the denominator, we have the sum, which would be 800 minus J600, and the unit is ohm. Now, as you can see from this, what's going to happen is that this ohm will divide into this ohm squared and leave us with a value of ohms, which is absolutely correct. 
Now before we can proceed on this is we have a denominator which is not friendly uh, when we look at division. So let's convert it in the polar form. So for the denominator, and I made this name specifically because what I've done too many times is solve the denominator and being interested in solving the problem I move on without dividing into the numerator. So I've actually named this denominator to help me not to make the mistake of doing that again. So this is simply going to be equal to the square root of the sums of the squares inverse tangent. And in this case that's going to be negative 600. So representing the capacitor divided by 800. And that comes out to be 1000 ohms at negative 36.87 uh, degrees. And uh, actually I shouldn't have uh, the ohms symbol here. Yet. So doing the division now, uh, all I have to do is multiply the numerator together. I've got the denominator in polar form. And when I uh, multiply the numerators, I get 400 times uh, e, E3. So there's three zeros behind this at negative 90 degree, degrees uh, ohms squared. So I haven't taken care of that yet. Now. If we look at this, when we multiply, we add the angles. So we have 0 plus a negative 90 degrees gives us negative 90 degrees. Okay, we're all set to uh, do the division here. So um, if we divide this by this, what we end up with is 480 ohms. And now I'm going to be exhaustively careful with the angles. I have negative 90. And in the denominator, I want to subtract this guy, so that's going to be minus a negative 36.87. You have to be careful here, because this is a place that's prone to error. And what we want to do is follow the rules of addition when it comes to doing this. So the rules say, when you're subtracting, is change the operation to add and reverse the sign of the um, divisor. So we have negative 36.8 and here we have plus 36.8. So having done those two things, uh, it's very easy to add these together and that gives us a total angle of negative uh, 53.13 degrees. So putting it all together, we have the total ends up being 480 at negative 53.13 degrees ohms. Now another instructor does it this way, and uh, I think this is pretty cool. I've never done this before myself, but instead of writing this as E3, he'll write it as K. And what he ends up with is 480K divided by 1K, and then he simply divides out the Ks. And uh, that may be a little bit simpler than dealing with E3. So whenever he has like an E3 or an E6, he'll put in K or KK respectively. And sometimes that makes solving the problem a little bit easier. You don't have to deal with the exponent. So uh, whatever works, uh, that's our total impedance for the parallel circuit right here. And that means if we would be looking in like this, again, at some frequency and at some value of C, we would see a Z total of that amount. Here's our circuit, and now let's figure out what the currents are. Well, that's really pretty easy for the two components to see in the R because they're parallel and we know what the voltage is. So basically that's AC Ohm's law. So the capacitor current is going to be equal to V, this guy, divided by the impedance of the capacitor, which we determined on the previous page in polar form was 600 at negative 90 degrees ohms. And that will give us 13.3 repeat at plus 90 degrees milliampers. And while I'm here, let me convert that into rectangular form. Plus J, 13.3 repeat milliampers. So that's going to be the current through the capacitor lying on the plus J axis. Remember that in a capacitor, the current leads the voltage. You have to remember that. Uh, the resistor current is simply Ohm's law again, 8 at 0 degrees, to this guy, divided by 800 at 0 degrees, 
gives us 10 at 0 degrees milliampers. Now to find a total current is uh, what we've got here, and this is kind of the plot of it, I'm going to jump ahead for a second, is we see that the capacitor current is sitting on the plus J axis, and your resistor current is on the real axis, so if we want to add these together, we have to use the square root of the sum of the squares again to find out what the total current would be. Easy enough, square root of 13.5 milliampere squared plus 10 milliampere squared, and now for the angle, so this is going to be the inverse tangent. Remember, inverse means you want the angle. And this is going to be 13.3. This is positive 13.3 because um, current leaves the voltage divided by 10 ohms. And uh, what that gives us for a total current is 16.6 .6 at 15.3 milliamps. Okay, so the plot on this Again, um, 10 real, 13.3, repeat imaginary, do the dotted line here, and we end up with our total current, this being this, uh, this phaser, and sitting between uh, the real and the phaser, we have 53.1 degrees. So that's what the current plot of that would look like. Okay. One more little thing to do here. And that is going to be the impedance plot. So from the previous page, the impedance was found to be 480 at negative 53.13 degrees ohms. So if we want to plot this correctly without using a protractor and a ruler, <coughs> highly not recommended, is we're going to break it down into real and imaginary parts. So the real part of the impedance is going to be equal to 480. Cosine operator is going to give us the real value. Our angle comes out to be 280 ohms. The imaginary part, again, using the sine operator, is going to come out to be minus J 384 ohms. So when we plot this, Here's our minus J384 ohms and our 280 uh, ohms real. Do the dotted thing, draw the line here for the impedance, and that's 480 ohms, and the angle in here is 53.13 degrees. Now, it may be confusing that the current is positive J and the impedance is negative J, but when you divide into voltage, like for the currents, you can kind of see why the sign changes. So that's something you have to be familiar with. And uh, probably a good idea just to just to memorize it so you don't make mistakes. Now, we have plotted this, and at the same time we did something different, which is kind of interesting, is if I were to draw this, uh, or to write it down rather in rectangular form is what I'd see would have 280 ohms real minus J384. So uh, effectively what I've done is I've converted the parallel circuit into a series circuit. And the series circuit and the parallel circuit are exactly the same. Now, at any given frequency, and if we couldn't see the way the parts were wired, we would have no idea whether inside a box they were this value in series or this value in parallel. Now, uh, that's going to come in very convenient a little bit later, and what had happened here is it fell out of the calculation to plot the impedance properly, which would be doing it in rectangular form and not guessing at the magnitude or the angle. So that's kind of a plus, and um, uh, power factor conversions uh, down the roadway will uh, will make uh, good use of this. So this will conclude the first method of finding the impedance, which is uh, product over sum. And uh, if you have more than three parts in parallel, you can do product over sum twice. However, you have to be super careful to carry out your digits pretty far so that you end up with an answer that has the correct 
um, and valid significant digits because if you can see I've been rounding in here a little bit and those rounds done again could be lead to a, uh, an error which wouldn't be good so we're going to see other ways of doing this uh, that uh, may be easier maybe not the third way is the most difficult so uh, that'll conclude the component I'm using um, uh, product over sum and do know it's basically the same as what you learned in DC is just that once again we have to be super careful with the angles of our uh, of our components so thank you for watching